Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Pana was wrong. You guys are awake this morning, um, which is good because uh, today, this is, I have to preface this sermon, we're going to talk about sleep. Um, and so if you feel yourself nodding off, raise your hand and a deacon will be assigned to you to help uh, make sure, maybe grab you by the ear or something and uh, we'll make sure we get through it. So hopefully, hopefully we all stay, stay together on this one. Um, this morning we're going to talk about a story that is actually found in all four of the Gospels, yet I don't think that we... Uh, discuss it that much. Or at least maybe it's a detail in a story that we do discuss but we don't focus on uh, very much. And uh, maybe it's because we're uncomfortable with it and maybe it's because we um, feel that it isn't too relevant for us today and I think it's probably the second there. But if all four gospel authors thought it significant enough to include, then it must be important, right? Well, this story is going to take place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and for some of you, you might hear that and you think, oh, this is, uh, we're coming up on Easter. And so this is just our pre-Easter uh, celebration uh, of the resurrection uh, service sermon. And while, yes, I do think it fits well, I, I want to emphasize, I think this is something that's going to ring true for every day and not just for the celebration of the resurrection. Um, and on that note, I think we should celebrate the resurrection every day and not just on uh, a certain uh, April morning. Um, <clears throat> so with that, let's dive in. And we're going to read from Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. So we're going to read a good chunk, but just bear with me. And again, Raise your hand if, you, if you're nodding off while I'm, while I'm reading this. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, um, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he's, oh, you know, let me look at this. One second. And taking with him Peter and, okay, that was right. Sorry, I thought you skipped something. But taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away, and he prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying the words again. And then he came to the disciples, and he said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. For um, sleep, I'm sorry, I'm jumping between here. Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So, reading that, what would you say is the point of the story? You see, all four gospel authors thought it was important to mention that the disciples fell asleep while Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. But... What is the point for us today? You see, growing up, I think when I heard this story, I often ended up being disappointed in the disciples. It's easy to be disappointed in them and say, man, Jesus asked you to stay awake and you couldn't, you couldn't do it. You couldn't be there for him. 
It feels sometimes like when you're in Sabbath school and you're reading about the Israelites wandering through the desert for 40 years and they start complaining and you sit in your air-conditioned room and you say to yourself, man, they just needed to be content with what they had. You get disappointed in them. You get disappointed in the, the Israelites and you get disappointed in the disciples. But is that really the point here? Did the gospel writers all point out this detail that they fell asleep simply for us to read and say, man, the, the disciples were kind of a letdown on that one. Also, just for reference, uh, if you want to find the other accounts of this, it's in, we're in Matthew 26, but it's also in Mark 14, Luke 22, and then in John 17, you get a detailed uh, version of Jesus' prayer in the garden. But the reason we're looking at the Matthew account, I think, this morning will become clear and apparent soon. But for now, thinking about that question, what is the point of this story and why is this included? I want you to think about what happens to the disciples after they wake up. Because they don't just wake up, apologize, say, oh, I'm sorry, Jesus, and they move on with their life. No, life gets crazy as soon as they wake up. Jesus wakes them up and suddenly everything is chaos. Have you ever had a, a nap or a sleep where you woke up and everything was confusing? This happened to me not long ago. We got back from the, our young adult retreat to Sequoia and there was a lot of driving involved in that, a lot of activity, a lot of fun, and I got home and I dropped my bag and pretty much fell into bed. And when I woke up, I had to check my watch, not to see just what time it was. I was concerned if it was still the same day. Sometimes you wake up and you just are completely bewildered and lost and confused. There's a reason we talk about jerking awake, because you have to somehow clear this, this brain fog state of confusion. And now take that of experience those emotions, that sense of bewilderment, and apply it to the disciples in this situation. Because what they're doing is they're following the Messiah, the Son of God, who they believe is their future king that's going to save them from the Romans. They don't know any different yet at this point. And they aren't thinking that anything crazy is going to be happening now. They're just waiting for the good things to happen in the future. And so they have a nice little dinner, some bread and, and wine, and Jesus says some things, as he often does, and now they're in a beautiful garden. Jesus says, hey, I want you to stay here and pray. I'm going to go over there for a while and pray for myself. And so Jesus goes off. You sit there. You pray for five, ten minutes. You start wondering how much longer is it appropriate your eyes get heavy, as Matthew says, the disciples' eyes were heavy, and they fall asleep. But Jesus wakes them up, not with a gentle, hey guys, I'm sorry, I know you're tired, let's, let's get moving. He wakes them up, and he says, wake up, my betrayer is here. The betrayer? This is the king, the future king of the Jews, this is the Messiah. There's not supposed to be a betrayer. And as they're waking up and they're in that already jerked awake sense of confusion and bewilderment, Jesus says, wake up, my betrayer is here. Okay, that's weird. And then as you're trying to process those two things, Judas walks up. And you notice he's been acting strange lately, but he walks up, he kisses Jesus, and he has Jesus arrested. You see, I think sometimes we think they fell asleep and then everything just was whatever after that. But their lives were turned completely upside down when they woke up from that nap, let alone the fact that they had to wake up and figure out what was going on around them. And I think when you think about it in this context, it's no wonder that Peter cuts a dude's ear off. There was a lot happening, a lot to process. I think he's allowed to freak out a little bit. 
But here's the thing. Jesus warned the disciples to stay awake. And I'm not only talking about the couple times that he woke them up and encouraged them to pray, to stay vigilant, to stay awake. I'm also talking about what happened one chapter before in Matthew 25. Jesus tells a parable at the beginning of the chapter, as he often does, but this parable I think is significant for us this morning. It's the parable of the ten bridesmaids. And now if you're not familiar with this parable, it's a story about ten women who were bridesmaids for a wedding. And Jesus says that five of these girls were wise and five of them were not so bright. They had lamps that they needed to bring with them in order to get into the wedding feast. And as lamps worked back in the day, you needed oil in order to make a lamp actually burn to provide a light. So you needed to not only be ready for the wedding, but you also had to have a lamp and you needed to have oil. Now, I actually get to go to a wedding tomorrow of two of my friends, which is, is fun and exciting, and I'm not in it. So I get to just sit back and uh, break out the popcorn and uh, watch two of my friends kiss in front of everybody, um, which is exciting. And I just get to enjoy the, the celebration and the special time with them. But I have been involved in weddings before. I've, I've been able to be a groomsman, I've been the best man, and, and I've officiated a wedding. Um, kind of the big three, I guess. And uh, it's a different kind of pressure. If you've been in a wedding, and I'm not even just talking about your own wedding if you're married, if you've been involved in somebody else's wedding, you know that there's a sense of pressure of being involved in somebody else's wedding. Because you know that while it's not about you, it's not your day, it's their special day, and you don't want to forget anything. You don't want to mess anything up. You don't want to trip walking down the aisle and breaking your leg, and everything gets ruined. These are the kind of things we have these anxious thoughts about as we're feeling the pressure of being involved, and we don't want to mess anything up. We don't want to forget anything when you're involved in somebody else's wedding. But that's exactly what happens to five of these bridesmaids, five of these women. Five of them brought extra oil with them for their lamps, but five neglected to bring any extra. And now Jesus says in verse 5 that the bridegroom was delayed, and so the girls became drowsy and they fell asleep. Drawing a connection yet? They wake up and people are shouting, They're here, they're here, they've arrived. They wake up and they're in that brain fog state of confusion. They're trying to figure everything out. And in that state of confusion, the five foolish bridesmaids realize that they don't have any oil for their lamps. And so they start to panic. And they turn to their other five bridesmaids and they say, hey, can you, can you give us some? And the, the other bridesmaids say, we can't. Otherwise, we, we won't have any for ourselves. They say, why don't you go out and see if you can find any oil to buy? And so the bridesmaids, they go out, and this is, you, this is fun. You're hearing me paraphrase as you're actually looking at the Bible here. This is good. Um, they go out, but all the stores are closed because now it's late at night. And so the five bridesmaids who are out of oil, they finally run out of options. And so they come and they knock on the door, the gate of the wedding feast. And they say, will you please let us in? And in verse 12, the groom answers the door, and he says, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. So Jesus finishes by saying in verse 13, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now let's go back to the garden in chapter 26. One chapter later, and what happens? Jesus asks the disciples to stay awake, to stay vigilant, he asks this of his, his close friends, the, the people that he knows and loves, to stay awake and to pray with him and for him. And what do they do? They fall asleep. Like the bridesmaids, even though they were told to be ready, they fell asleep and wake up completely unprepared for what was happening. You see, 
I don't think this story is just to make us feel bad for the disciples or to feel disappointed in the disciples. I think this story is a warning against falling asleep. Jesus even tells the disciples how to stay awake. He says, pray with me, and yet they still fall asleep. And I think we can all relate to and understand this struggle a little bit. It's easy to get distracted or tired during prayer sometimes. You know, I was blessed to grow up in a God-fearing household, and I'm grateful to my mom and dad who are here, to um, the way they raised me right. And uh, I learned from my dad uh, how to cover all the bases in the prayer for a meal, how to pray for everything and everyone um, while the food gets cold. I learned how to do that. Um, and as a kid, it was difficult for me because when you bow your head over a meal, it just brings your nose closer to the food. <laughs> and how am I supposed to, to focus on the prayer while I'm drooling over my plate of food? I, it's, it's a difficult thing as a child to focus. And so sometimes I would have to open my eyes and look at anything else. Maybe my dad saying the prayer so I could focus on the prayer and the blessing for the meal. It's difficult sometimes to stay focused. Maybe you pray by your bedside and you found yourself uh, slumped over on the bed and you wake up and it's two in the morning and you jerk awake and you say, what happened? Sometimes it's easy to get distracted while you're praying. So getting lost in prayer isn't just a problem for kids. It's something we all struggle with and it's something that we all relate to. So if Jesus calls us to stay awake, how do we do that? Because we want to stay awake, we want to be vigilant, but we also know we need to pray to do that, and we want to be people who pray. But it's hard for us to do even one of those things, let alone both at the same time. I'm going to suggest this morning that we need to start praying with our eyes open. I don't necessarily mean literally, but bear with me for a second. Uh, did you know that actually the way that we pray today and, and our physical posture for prayer is actually opposite for the majority of biblical prayer? Did you know that? The way we pray today is we, we fold our hands, we, we bow our heads, and we close our eyes, and this is how we, how we pray. But biblical prayer, more often than not, was head back, eyes open, arms stretched wide. The complete opposite of what we do today. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that praying like this is, is wrong. It's, it's a posture of reverence and humility. And especially uh, those of us who have had kids can attest that it's necessary sometimes to, to help bring the focus in, to have your eyes closed and hands folded. So I'm not saying that this posture of prayer is wrong. But sometimes I do think changing our physical posture of prayer can be good and beneficial for our prayer, and actually, if you're worried about doing it, it is biblical as well. So, one, I do think we can think about our physical posture of prayer, and again, if you're falling asleep by your bedside, um, maybe this is a good time to start thinking about that. But the point I'm making here, and the main point I'm making, has much less to do with your physical posture during prayer, and much more to do with your mental posture. You see, I don't believe that Jesus was telling his disciples to pray simply for the sole purpose of having them stay awake. I think, one, he wanted their prayers. He needed their prayers. And two, I think he wanted their mentality, their mental posture, to be in a place where they could be as prepared as possible for what was coming. Without them knowing the future, without them understanding what was about to take place, Jesus wanted them and their mental posture to be in the right place. So he asked them to pray. And Jesus was not unsympathetic to their weariness. Um, and Jesus was actually sweating blood because he was under so much strain and stress for what was taking place. We find that in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, in his account. Jesus was tired too, and he said, please stay awake with me, pray with me so that you can be ready. 
When they woke up and everything was chaos for them, it wasn't just because they woke up from a nap and jerked awake. It was because they neglected what Jesus was telling them. He neglected their call to be vigilant, to have a mental posture of being connected to God and being ready for what was about to take place. I still don't think that we should just be disappointed in the disciples, though, that they failed to be ready, that they failed to be mentally prepared. I think that's still not the point. The point, I believe, is for us to see what the disciples did and to learn from their example of what to avoid today. Because although we're not physically in the garden with Jesus about to be arrested and eventually crucified in front of us right now, Jesus shared that there is a lot more still to come. And I'm not even speaking just about end time events or eschatological things here. I'm saying that God has a purpose for every single person here today. And are you going to be ready when he calls on you? You see, the story of the disciples, I believe, falling asleep in the garden, I think it is for us today what the parable of the bridesmaids was for them. It is both a warning about falling asleep at bad times, both literally and metaphorically, and it's also a call and a challenge to stay awake. Jesus has called each of us here today. He has called us all to something bigger than ourselves. And yes, that does mean we should be aware of end time events and what's coming and what's going to take place in the future. But if that's all we're focused on, if that's all we're waiting for, what if we're sleeping through how God is working and moving right now today? I said earlier that I think perhaps we don't talk about this part of the story so much because we don't feel that it's relevant to us. We don't feel like we can relate to disciples who fell asleep in that specific situation. But I think if we take that stance, we're no better than the disciples. You might say, or you might say to yourself, but the disciples had Jesus right in front of them, and they neglected what he asked of them. And to that I would respond, do you not believe that Jesus is right in front of you today, working and moving in your life? Do you not believe that God can use you today? If you believe God is working, if you believe God is doing things today and God can use you, stay awake this morning. Stay awake every day. Amen. But how do you do that? How do you do that? You pray with your eyes open. If you need to change your physical posture for prayer, if you need to, to start going to a window like Daniel did and look up towards the heaven and pray, if you, if you find yourself struggling to focus with whatever you're used to with praying and you need to switch it up. I encourage you to try that. But the challenge this morning is to keep your eyes open to the world around you as you pray. You believe that God is working today, so you pray for the world right now. And I think especially as Adventists, we do the, the beautiful work of praying for the second coming and praying about end time events. And we should not stop that. We need to be thinking about end time events, not in an anxious way, but in a way that we are mentally prepared for what is coming, sharing the good news. But I do not want us to, as we pray for the second coming to happen, neglect how God has already come and is working with us here today and what he wants to do among us. Let's not do that in this church. Let's be a people that, that prays with our eyes open. Let's be a people that doesn't just wait for the future, sleeping when God wants to use us now today. Amen. Let's not wake up suddenly when God calls us and our job falls through and we have to move completely across the country and everything happens and our world is turned upside down. And then later on, we look back and we say, wow, God was using me in that moment or God had a plan for me. Let's not 
pass somebody on the street and look back on it later on and say, wow, I felt really called to be with that person in that moment, and yet I ignored it because I, didn't, I wasn't mentally prepared for what was going on. When someone we love needs us and, and, and is in a hard time, sometimes it, it's difficult. It takes a second to adjust. Okay, I have to focus from instead of what's going on good here, I have to switch my mindset. Let's not be people that struggle to do that. Let's be people that are mentally awake, vigilant, connected to God, ready for the way that he is moving. Let's be prepared. Let's be a people that, that praise together. Let's be a people that stay awake for God in the way that he wants to move us. And then, now let's worship together with, with a closing hymn. This hymn is a hymn that looks forward to the future. But I want us to be thinking as we look forward to the future, as we worship God in the future that is to come, let us do so awake, aware, vigilant, and ready for God to move in our lives right now, today. Amen.